This sermon is titled Resurrection Psalms. Be enriched as you listen. All right, we're going to read quite a few portions of scripture this morning before we get into the message. So let's turn first in our Bibles to the 24th chapter of Luke. I know we read from the early part of that chapter just before we started our time of worship today. So we go to Luke 24 and look at uh, thanks, verse 13 onwards. Luke chapter 24, we're going to read verses 13 to 27 first. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 24. I request you to follow along with me, please. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all, to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what I want to highlight here, of course, we are familiar with this part of the gospel account where Jesus is walking with these two disciples and you know he's listening to their conversation he gets in on the conversation and then in the process of that he like it says here in verse 27 he starts off with Moses that means the first five books and he and going on through the prophets he explains the scriptures concerning himself That means from the Old Testament, he's explaining to them and helping them understand all that has transpired the last few days. I also want us to read, we're going to read quite a bit, so hope you're ready to do that. Acts chapter 2, just another passage. Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's sermon, the very first sermon preached post the ascension of Christ. It's the inaugural sermon for the church on the day of Pentecost. And Peter is preaching. We're going to read a few verses from his sermon, verses 29 to 32. Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 32. And this is what Peter says in his sermon. He says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, That he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, 
he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So this is the day of Pentecost. And the way God timed everything, Jesus was crucified on Passover, the day of Passover. Three days later was the day of uh, the first fruits, the beginning of the harvest. And that was the day Jesus rose from the dead. Fifty days later is Pentecost, the first fruits, and this is the harvest day. And on that day, the church is born. The Holy Spirit is poured out and the church is born. And Peter stands up and he's preaching. Now, of course, you just have to imagine this in your mind, what happened on that day of Pentecost. Uh, the Jews who were scattered all around the Mediterranean would make their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, most of them would plan to stay for an extended time uh, for probably, you know, uh, these... Uh, this 60-day period to go through uh, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Passover, the first fruits, and then followed up with the day of Pentecost, or spread over 60 days. And all of a sudden, in that 60-day period, Jerusalem, the population in Jerusalem would just go up maybe fivefold. You know, so, uh, you know, you had several thousands of people in that city. Jewish people would come in from various spots around the Mediterranean. And so, G and so Peter has this Jewish audience. He's speaking to them. He has to explain to them about what has just happened, about the resurrection of Christ. What does he do? He speaks to them about their patriarch. Now, two important patriarchs, Abraham, the father, the pioneer, the founder, and then David, very important patriarch. So he says, all of you know about David. His tomb is still with us today. That means he dies. He hasn't been raised, but he was a prophet, and he saw something ahead of time. God revealed to him that of his own, one of his own would come somebody who would sit on his throne. And not only would this man sit on his throne, but this person would be raised from the dead. And so he's telling them, David prophesied or see, saw before time the resurrection of Christ. And he spoke about the resurrection of Christ. And what David spoke about is what we are witnessing to you today. Are you with me? So that's part of Peter's sermon. Now, none of the Jews are going to argue with David. As a patriarch, two of the most respected people in their heritage, Abraham and David. And Peter is pointing to David. What I want us to do this morning is to read three Psalms of David. Are you okay with that? Right? We're going to read more scripture. Three Psalms of David. These are short Psalms. And out of these psalms, well, I, we just, I just call them resurrection psalms, because in these three psalms, all written by David, David foretold the incarnation, the resurrection, and the exaltation, and all that would come thereafter that. Now remember, David lived a thousand years before Jesus Christ. So 1,000 years before Christ, David spoke of his resurrection. So I want us to read those three Psalms, please, and then just highlight some of the things that David prophesied, which you and I, are, which we know that Jesus fulfilled and will fulfill. There are some that are still waiting to be fulfilled. And this is what we believe. So we're going to read three Psalms, Psalm 2, Psalm 16, and Psalm 110. And then we're going to wrap it up by saying, what did David say you and I would do uh, as people who believe in this? Do you know that David prophesied about you? 
Tell your neighbor, he spoke about you. Right? You don't sound very convinced. Tell your neighbor, David prophesied about you. Okay, we're going to read about that today. All right, so before we close today, you'll find out your place in Bible prophecy as spoken by the prophet David. All right, I'll tell you the very end. Psalm 2. Let's go. I hope you're there. We'll read Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet... I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those, all those who put their trust in him. Now, I know in some of our Bibles it may not uh, headline this psalm as a psalm of David, but when you read in Acts chapter 4, uh, Peter speaking there by the Holy Spirit refers to this as a psalm of David. And so we know that. Psalm 16, please. Again, a psalm of David. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows, shall, their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink off, offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The last psalm we're going to read today, Psalm 110, please. A psalm of David, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Now, it would be good to do a verse-by-verse verse study of all of these three psalms, but uh, we don't have time to do that. So I'm just going to bring out the key highlights of all of these three psalms. Now, all these three psalms, Psalm 2, 16, and 110, in some way or another are speaking about the resurrection of Christ and all that will happen thereafter. You say, how do we know it? It's because in the New Testament, the New Testament points back and says, this is being fulfilled which David 
spoke about. Are you with me? So that's why we know the New New Testament is pointing back and saying Christ is fulfilling these prophecies. And so I want to highlight some of the things that David prophesied in these three Psalms about Jesus Christ and your place and my place in all that Christ has accomplished. So the first thing we see here in these three Psalms, and I'm just summarizing this, is is that David said this. He said, you are my son, I have begotten you. This is in Psalm 2 and verse 7. And uh, uh, this verse, this particular verse is quoted often in the New Testament. In Acts 13, when uh, the apostle Paul is preaching on his first missionary journey. He comes to a place called Antioch of Sidia, uh, which is in modern-day Turkey. He comes into the synagogue, as they normally would do, along with Barnabas. And he's, he has his audience, Jewish audience. He's preaching to them about Jesus. And then he points back to Psalm 2, and he says, You know, David prophesied, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, and this son whom he's talking about is whom we are preaching to you about. So David, 1,000 years before Christ, made this glorious announcement about the incarnation of Christ. He spoke about somebody whom God would say, you are my son, and I have begotten you. There's only one will fulfill that perfectly. Psalm 16, the other psalm we read, the first eight verses, are describing life of such a person who's living in total submission to the Father. And and, and while David walked in it, Jesus perfectly embodied it. And it is this son that we are preaching about. The same verse, Psalm 2, verse 7, is quoted often in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, talking about the incarnation of Jesus. And again in Hebrews 5, in verse 5, the same verse is quoted. So think about this. David didn't necessarily understand everything. But he spoke and said, There is somebody to whom God would say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, that does not mean, now, you know, when we think about birth, we think about beginning of life. So we must not understand that incorrectly. So we need to, you know, technically we'd say, you need to get our Christology right. That is our understanding of Christ, right? So it doesn't mean Christ's life began there. It means that the eternal God, the eternal word, who was part of the Godhead, co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, fully God, who could fully represent God, laid aside His powers of deity and took on humanity, chose to walk as a man, and in doing so, became a fulfillment of this one who could be called the Son of God. Because He chose to walk under the unction of the Holy Spirit and in submission to the Father. And so he's called the Son of God. That does not mean he wasn't deity. He was deity who chose to become a man. And to such a person, God says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Are you with me? So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came into this world, he came for you and me. He came to save us. He came to die for us on the cross, to pay for our sins. And the Bible says he came to be the captain of our salvation, so that he could bring many sons into glory. Why did he come? Because he wants to bring you into glory. So everything he did on the cross, he did it so that you and I could have an entrance into glory, into a into the presence of God, to be with God. And that's why He is the captain of our salvation. He's the captain of your salvation. And He's the only one who can provide salvation to you and me today. The Bible says there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we can be saved. It's only in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen if you believe it? You are my son. I have begotten you. 
And he came also to show us how sons and daughters of God would live. He is the perfect prototype. He is our model whom we follow and uh, you know, a, a model our life after. He is a perfect example of what a son and a daughter of God should live like. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. The second thing we see in these Psalms is this. David spoke about, he mentioned this in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. David said, he will not see corruption. And like we mentioned a little earlier, Peter in his inaugural sermon points back and says, you know, David said, he spoke about somebody who will not see corruption. And we know for sure he wasn't speaking of himself because his tomb is here and David did not rise up from the dead. So who was David talking about? And you can imagine the Jewish audience saying, Peter, please tell us. Who was he talking about? Because he couldn't be talking about himself. Because we know his tomb is here. But David spoke of somebody who said, who, of whom he said, You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you allow me to see corruption. But you will bring me into your presence where there is fullness of joy. Who is he talking about? And, David, and Peter says, we're talking about Jesus. This, who's, this is whom David spoke about. Amen? And so, Psalm, Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, is a powerful announcement of the resurrection. And this psalm is once again also referred to by the Apostle Paul in his sermon that I, I mentioned about when he was in that synagogue in Antioch of Syria. I was speak, as he was speaking, as Paul was speaking to his Jewish audience, he once again points back to Psalm 16. As though, it's almost as though Paul copied Peter's sermon notes. You know. He's taking the same trail through the Old Testament to convince his Jewish audience that Jesus Christ is the one who's been raised up from the dead. He's the one whom David spoke, spoke about saying, I will not leave your soul in hell, neither will I let you see corruption. So, this is Jesus, the one who's been raised from the dead, whom we are celebrating today. Amen? So what does Christ's resurrection mean to us? It means he has conquered he has risen triumphant. Uh, he has conquered sin. He's conquered the grave. He's conquered every demonic power. Everything Adam put us under, Jesus put us over. Amen? And you can live like a child of Adam or you can live like a child of Jesus. A, a person who's, who's been delivered or redeemed by Jesus. That's your choice. As a descendant of Adam, we will live in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. But as people who have been redeemed by Christ, we will reign in life through Christ. Amen. So we have to make a mental shift. Do you want to identify with Adam's race or Jesus' race? Let me hear you. Do you want to identify with Adam's race or Jesus' race? Adam is called the first man. Jesus, the Bible talks about him as the last Adam. He was the first Adam, the first man. Jesus is the last Adam. Why? Because in Jesus, Adam's race ends and a new race begins. That's why he's called the last Adam. Adam, goodbye to your race. He has a new creation coming forth. But the choice is yours and mine. Do you want, you know, God has given us new creation life in Christ. And he's saying, don't live by Adam's race. Live by what I've done for you in Christ. So Adam is called, he's called the first man. But Jesus is the second man. It's as though the entire human race, there are only two men. Adam, Christ, the heavenly man. And we can choose whom you want to identify from. Are you listening? 
So when we celebrate Christ's resurrection, we are saying we identify with this one who conquered sin, Satan, and death. We're not identifying with Adam. He put us under. We are identifying with Jesus who brought us over. And therefore, we want to live as overcomers in this world. We refuse to live as victims to sin and Satan. Because Christ came to conquer Satan. Why did he have to become human so he could represent you and me? And as our representative, meet with Satan. And saying, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for them. Jesus never did, needed to do this for himself. He was already God. But the reason he became human is to represent you and me and deal with the devil on our behalf. So you and I might say, I'm going to walk in that. I'm going to take what Jesus provided for me. Amen? So David spoke about this triumph and resurrected Jesus. He made a powerful announcement of this resurrection. Revelation 1.18, Jesus speaks of himself and he says, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And what does that mean? He says, I have the keys of Hades and death. I've conquered everything that oppresses the human race. The third thing we see in these Psalms uh, when David said this in Psalm 110, now we look at Psalm 110, verse 1. Uh, David said, he will be seated on the Father's right hand. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is a powerful announcement of Christ's glorification. That he is crowned with glory and honor at the Father's right hand. And you know, it's very interesting <coughs> that the Lord Jesus quoted Psalm 110 verse 1 in Matthew chapter 22 verses 41 to 45. He was speaking to the Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he said, you know, I have a question for all of you. Now, these are all the Jewish scribes and scholars, and they've all studied the Old Testament scriptures. He said, I have a question for you. David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Who was the Lord David was talking about? So before that, he set them up for this question. He asked them, who is the Messiah. So the Messiah is David's descendant. Well and good. Next question. Psalm 110 verse 1. Whom was David referring to when he said, The Lord said to my Lord. Who was David referring to? Now they all knew in their minds, but they don't want to say it. He's referring to the Messiah. And Jesus was telling them, I am the Messiah. I am that one whom David was referring to in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, God the Father, said to my Lord, God the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So David spoke about this, the glorif glorification of this one. And once again, Peter quotes this again. In his inaugural sermon in Acts chapter 2, he, he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. And you know, very interesting, Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. That's how important Psalm 110 is. And you are there in Psalm 110. Keep searching. <laughs> we'll let you know before we close, okay? Okay. But Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. And this verse, verse 1 of Psalm 110, is quoted very often in the New Testament. Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28, when he talks about the, the time when Christ will put all, when God will put all enemies and subject them to Christ. And the writer of Hebrews quotes it in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 13. So, this is a powerful announcement of the glorification of Christ. 
Can you imagine David spoke and said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make all your enemies your footstool. And that's the Christ we worship. Today, Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. And we know he's been given a name that is above every other name. That at his name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And we are worshiping somebody who tasted death for every person. But Hebrews 2.9 says, he is crowned today with glory and honor. What David spoke about has been fulfilled. The fourth one, I'll just very quickly go through and point out these things that we see here. The fourth one, this is in Psalm 110. David prophesied. He said, he is a priest forever. This is verse 4. He is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is a powerful announcement of Christ's intercession. I mean, how could David say, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was an Old Testament person that we read about very, very briefly. He was a king of Jerusalem, but he was also the high priest of the Most High God, or the priest of the Most High God. There were no high priests at that time, so he was a king and a priest. And David is speaking of somebody, he doesn't know who, and he's saying this somebody has been um, made to sit at the Father's right hand, and this somebody is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this particular verse is quoted so many times in the book of Hebrews, pointing to Jesus and saying, Jesus is the one that David was speaking about, meaning a priest who had no beginning, no ending, he's forever. And today, Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is your great high priest. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the Father's right hand. But David foretold what he will do being there. He was, he'll be there as your and mine great high priest. Amen? As our high priest, he's representing us before the Father. That means he's a high priest of our confession, the Bible says. That means when you declare your faith in Christ, when you declare your faith in God, there's somebody before the throne of God representing that confession before the Father. That's why Jesus Christ is called the high priest of our confession. Amen? That means what you say, that you believe, Jesus is the high priest of. He's our great high priest to aid us when we are tempted. Because the Bible says he's touched by the feelings of our weaknesses. And he aids those who are of the seed of Abraham. So as your high priest, he not only represents your confession. As your high priest, he stands there to intercede for you. And to assist you to overcome the challenges that you and I are facing as we journey through life. This is the Jesus whose resurrection we are celebrating today. Amen. And he, as our high priest, he enables us to come boldly to the throne of grace. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, the writer of Hebrews says, Seeing then that we have such a great high priest, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? Because you know Jesus is there. You can go boldly and, pr make and present your case or present your need before God and say, Lord, I need mercy and grace to help me in my time of need. Jesus is our great high priest. Number five, what else did David tell us about uh, the resurrected Christ? Number five, he said, he will laugh at earthly kings and rulers. And I'm jumping back to Psalm 2, verses 1 through 5. You know, this passage was quoted in Acts chapter 4, verse 25 to 26, as, uh, as the, uh, the apostles at that moment, and the apostles, the disciples, they were threatened by all the religious leaders. And they gather together and they say, Lord, like David said, why do the heathen rage? Why are they getting upset against the Lord and against his anointed? They quote Psalm 2 in their prayer because they know it's talking about Jesus. And what did David say in Psalm 2? 
you know, when rulers and kings and others are, uh, you know, moving against Jesus, what would God do? Call 911. Gabriel will answer on the other side. What would God do? When the kings of the earth, when the rulers of the earth, when they conspire, when they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, what will the Lord do? It says here in verse 4 of Psalm 2, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. What do you think God is doing? When the kings of the earth and the rulers of the earth are saying, let's put an end to this message of Jesus. Let's stop all this conversion. Let's stop all this preaching of the gospel. What do you think God is doing? He who sits in the heavens, let me hear you. Let's say it together, our God's laughing. Let's say it together, he who sits in the heavens will laugh. All over the world, there are people who are trying to stop the advancement of the gospel. They are trying to stop the advancement of the preaching of the anointed one. They think they can stop it. But the gospel is too powerful. No army on earth, no kingdom of man, no government of man has been able to stop the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God in heaven just laughs. He who sits in the heavens laughs. And David said, that's what will happen. It's a powerful announcement of Christ's exaltation over every earthly ruler and over every earthly king. It's a powerful announcement of the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one, nothing will stop it. Number six, David even prophesied or foretold the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He said that he will rule out of Zion over the nations. He will rule out of Zion over the... You see, if you and I were David, and we believe that somebody, one of our descendants will sit on our throne, we'd say, well, there's coming a descendant who will sit on my throne, and he will rule over Jerusalem. Or maybe let's give him a little bigger kingdom. He will rule over Israel. But what did David say? He will rule over, let me hear you, he will rule over nations. So David could definitely not be speaking from his mind. Who in his right mind would say, somebody's coming after me, one of my descendants, and he's going to rule over the nations. But both in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, he says, Ask of me, and I will give you nations for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Could not be another man. And he said, Out of Zion, this is Psalm 110, Out of Zion, you will rule. You will send the rod of your strength. Psalm 110 verse 2. The rod of your strength out of Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. And he talks about verse 6 in Psalm 110. He will judge among the nations. He will execute the heads of many countries. And if you you study the book of Revelation. So beautiful. Revelation 19. The book of Revelation. Many places. In Revelation 12. And again in Revelation 19, and again in Revelation 20. You read about Jesus as the one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's beautiful. Revelation 19 talks about Jesus. At the end of that tribulation period, that seven years of tribulation, and the setup and as part of the battle of Armageddon, says he will come. Riding on a white horse, clothed in white, a two-edged sword going out of his mouth. He will come to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will execute vengeance on their kings. What David prophesied in Psalm 110, Revelation says, Revelation 19 says, Christ fulfills that. 
It's yet to be fulfilled. But it's so amazing that David would prophesy then about Christ's millennial reign. And Revelation 20 verse 4 talks about Jesus ruling and reigning on the earth for a thousand years. The beautiful thing is this, that this same terminology is promised to the believer. Jesus says in Revelation 2, To him who overcomes, I will have you reign with me over the nations with the rod of iron. So not only is Christ going to rule, you and I will reign with Christ in his millennial reign. Amen? Found your place? But not only that, there's something more. As David brings out all of these wonderful things, he says, this is the last point, both in Psalm verse 2 and Psalm 110, he speaks to us. He tells people, he says, serve the Lord, worship team, please come. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing. And rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord. And this is what I want to close with, Psalm 110, verse 3. If you slept through the previous part of the sermon, time to wake up, please. <laughs> Don't miss this. Just make sure your neighbor is awake for this one. <laughs> Psalm 110, verse 3. It says, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. What does it say? Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. You see, the day of his power has begun because he is right now seated at the Father's right hand with all authority and power given to him. Yes, there is coming a millennial reign when Christ will come and establish his kingdom on the earth and out of Zion he will rule the nations. But the day of his power has already begun. And he is extending his rule and reign through his people. And what, is, what did David say? He spoke about you. Psalm 110 verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers. Meaning they will serve willingly. And when you say volunteers, we're not asking you to sign up for volunteer. <laughs> That's not the point. Okay. Now we do have a volunteer sign up. After service. In the main lobby. But that's not, it happened by accident. <laughs> it wasn't planned. The point is, David said that God's people will be willing servants. They will serve him willingly in the day of his power. And that's the call for you and me. To be willing servants of the Lord volunteers for the Lord in the day of his power. Today, Jesus is seated on the Father's right hand. He said all authority, all power in heaven and earth has been given to him. And he says, hey, people will be volunteers in the day of your power. How are they going to be clothed? They will be clothed with holiness. Verse, Psalm 110 verse 3. They will be clothed in holiness. And they will have the vigor of their youth. They will be energized, supernaturally energized by God. So God, the Lord in the day of his power is looking for volunteers, meaning people who will serve him willing, willingly. They will serve him gladly. They will be clothed in holiness and they will be empowered with the dew of their youth. That means they will be empowered by God. So we are celebrating Christ's triumph. It's so amazing that David spoke about the incarnation. He spoke about the resurrection. He spoke about Christ's glorification. He spoke about Christ's intercession. He spoke about Christ's exaltation over the kings and rulers of the earth. He spoke about Christ's coronation, meaning him being king, ruling on the earth. 
and then he spoke about you and me saying we will be volunteers in the day of his power we will be clothed with holiness and we will be given the dew of the youth dew of our youth and we will be energized by God are you ready to be a volunteer for the Lord amen I'm not saying go and sign up. I'm saying whatever God has called you to do. Whatever. You are here as an ambassador for Christ. You're representing the one who is seated on the throne. And the world needs to see Jesus in you and me. Amen. We are volunteers for such a great king. We are volunteers for the one who is seated, who laughs when people try to stop and at the advancement of his kingdom. We are volunteers for such a one. It's an honor to represent Jesus Christ. Whatever you're doing, some of you are students. Remember, when you go to your classroom, when you go to your college, you are representing the risen, exalted, glorified Jesus. Amen? You're representing this one whom David spoke about. Many of us here are professionals. We are working, we are doing something. You are his volunteer. And you go to your place of work. You go clothed with holiness. You go energized by the Lord to represent Him as His ambassador. Amen? This glorified Christ, you are representing right there. David spoke about you. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Some of us are homemakers. You say, don't leave us out. I'm not going to leave you out. Whatever you do at home, you take care of your family, you interact with people, you're representing Jesus right there in your home. You're a volunteer for such a great king. Amen? All of us, all of us, love him our volunteers I want to close with this David also said this he said kiss the son lest he be angry kiss the son it's talking about coming into a place of reconciliation and friendship Jesus I want you I'm coming under you kiss the son lest he be angry come into this place of relationship with Jesus Christ We're going to take a few moments to pray. If there's anyone here this morning, and maybe you've just decided to go to church on Easter Sunday, and maybe a friend invited you, maybe you're watching online, and you've never made a decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what your upbringing is, it doesn't matter where you are in life today. We all have the opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what the Bible invites all of us to do. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If there's anybody here in the audience, anybody watching online and You've never made a decision to believe in Jesus. You may have believed in a lot of other things, and many of us do. But to believe in Jesus for who He is, as the one who died for our sins on the cross, who was buried, who rose up again, who is alive today, and who is coming back to rule and reign on the earth, whom no man on earth and no army, no, no government, no kingdom on earth can stop. You've never made a decision to believe in such a one. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's your choice. You make that decision to believe 
in Jesus Christ. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if there's anyone in the auditorium, anyone watching online, if you feel in your heart, I want to do that today. I want to believe in this Jesus. You feel prompting in your own heart. No man is compelling you, but it's a choice of your own heart. Then please follow me in this prayer. Could we pray together, please? If you've never done this before, I want you to just pray this prayer with me, please. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe you rose up again and you're alive today. Please come into my life. Forgive my sins and make me a child of God and help me to live for you and you alone the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Is there anyone who prayed this prayer with me in this auditorium we just love to celebrate with you we just love to be happy that somebody prayed that prayer for the first time if you don't mind could you raise your hand anybody prayed this prayer with me for the very first time and you're in this auditorium just wave your hand at me so I could see anybody God bless you God bless you anybody else I see one hand right up here I see another hand way back there one up right up here God bless you. Just wave your hand, please. Now, we have a little gift. We have third hand. Some more hands here. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just wave your hand. We have a little bag that we give out to those people who prayed the prayer for the very first time. Right up here, please. And we want to celebrate with you. So, please make sure you get this bag. Just raise your hand up wherever you are. It's never too late. Uh, if you pray this prayer with me, I see another hand way up there. God bless Oh, there's another hand right here. God bless you. God bless you, please. Thank God bless you. We don't want to miss any hand. So please, please wave it until somebody comes and uh, gives it to you. Right? Along with that bag, there's a card that says decision card. And if you could please write your name and number and give it back to one of these volunteers who came to you. Just give it back to them or anyone with this badge, with a volunteer badge. Uh, then somebody from the church office will call you and help you show you tell you how to use these resources that are in the bag so just one more time before we change a little focus here uh, anybody else you prayed the prayer with me this morning received jesus made a decision of belief and uh, you haven't received the bag yet just, just raise your hand and make sure everybody gets it okay everyone's got god bless you all right now one of the bible one of the things the bible tells us is that jesus is so real he is the same yesterday, today, and for ever. He hasn't changed. He hasn't modernized. Thank God. He is still the same. Yesterday, today, and for ever. And we like to say this, the Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of today. And that's the Jesus we believe in. Amen. If he healed the sick, then he heals them today. If he turned water into wine, then he turns water into wine today. If he multiplied bread and fish, he, he does it again today. Now, you may not be needing bread and fish multiplied, but maybe something else that Jesus needs to do in your life. You may not be needing water to be turned to wine, but some other situation that you'd need Jesus to turn around. But he's still the miracle worker. Amen? The Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of today. Another thing we say very often is Bible faith works the same way today as it did in Bible times. God hasn't changed and faith in God hasn't changed. The times have changed. If faith in God would heal, bring healing in the Bible, then 2,000 years later, it's still the same. Do you agree with me? Now, let me ask you a trick question. What would gravity have been 
2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. What was it? Like 9.8 meters per second squared? <laughs> Whatever that is. I mean, the force of gravity. Gravity hasn't changed. Yes? Hasn't changed. Still the same. 2,000 years, 4,000 years. In other words, there are certain things that don't change with time. Faith in God has not changed. God has not changed. He is still the same, unchanging Jesus. And faith in God has not changed. Faith in God today will do the same thing it did in Bible times. That's why we encourage people. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. To the woman with an issue of blood, who could not have been who could not be cured in her day and time she didn't have the they didn't have the, the knowledge to bring healing for her through medicine she came and touched the hem of his garment and Jesus said daughter your faith has made you whole and we are not against doctors we're not against medicine we have doctors here but faith in God will do the same thing today as it did in Bible times. Because God hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. So this morning, because Jesus is real, we will pray and ask him to heal. Ask him to deliver. Ask him to meet your need. Ask him to work miracles in your lives. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong in doing that. Can we do that? So we're going to sing just just. Turn our attention to Jesus and declare him as our miracle worker. And then we're going to pray. And I want you to believe God right where you are. Saying the Lord, I need a touch. That's for healing, whether it's in your family, it's your finances, whatever. Lord, I need a touch. And we're going to pray and then we'll close. Could we rise to our feet, please? You deserve the glory and the honor, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor, Lord, we as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory and the honor Lord we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory all the glory and the honor As we lift your holy name, for you are great, you the miracle so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, for you are great, you the miracle so great, there is no
thank you. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer from here. And this moment, I want to invite us to do what that woman with the issue of blood did. She said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. That was her faith. It wasn't so much the physical touch, but was her faith touching Jesus. And all of us, right where we are, can touch Jesus. I will pray. I want to encourage you. Whatever your need is, the Lord knows. Whether it's a physical healing, whether it's a situation in your life that you're facing and you want Jesus to step in and, 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 and intervene in that situation. You pray. It's not about the words, but it's just about that simple faith. Say, Jesus, intervene. Lord Jesus, we glorify you. We exalt you. And we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you've given us your name, a name that is above every other name. So in that name, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over sickness and disease, physical conditions, affecting and afflicting God's people. In the name of Jesus, I command healing to take place in your body. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Be healed. Now all you do is simple. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive my healing. I receive. I receive. Lord, I speak these words in faith. In Jesus' name, I destroy every work of the enemy, every affliction, every spirit of affliction, every spirit of infirmity. I command you to leave. You've got problems in your legs. Let the healing power of God flow through your legs right now. And say, Lord, I receive my healing. I receive my healing. Father God, I just pray that every physical condition, there's so many things that people go through. But right now, in the name of Jesus, let the power of God flow. Let the power of God flow. Healing bones, healing nerves, healing ligaments and joints. Let the power of God flow. And God, do unexpected things. Maybe people here may not even be consciously asking for it but just do it for them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ let healing take place and Lord I also speak the work of God the miracles of God into people's situations things at home financial situations things at school and college and things in the place, work, place of work let them experience your miracle. Conflicts in relationships, let them experience your miracle. Conflicts in the workplace, God, let them experience your miracle. Thank you for hearing every prayer. Thank you, Father, for ministering to every need in this place. We thank you, God. Take, I want you to just take a moment. Just thank the Lord. Just thank Him. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for ministering to your people. Thank you for being faithful to your word. Thank you for touching your people. Thank you for intervening in their lives. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your deliverance, God. We thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss, what we normally do is 
If you have a testimony, we just want you to please email it to us, send it to us by email. So that one is we have a record of it so we know it's real and anybody questions us, we have. We, we can say it came by email. And we will share that you know, testimony with people and we do that from time to time. So the Lord has done something in your life. There's a healing or anything else. Just share that testimony and we will be able to share it with the congregations at our various locations. Just a few announcements after this service. Uh, food is being served in the food court. Uh, there are games happening there. Uh, volunteers, sign up desk is in the main lobby. Uh, you can collect your food coupons again in the main lobby area from the registration desk. If you haven't registered and would like to register and have lunch, you can do that as well in the um, main lobby. For all first-time visitors, you are our guests today. So if you're a first-time visitor, you can, you're just welcome. So you don't, you don't have to register in the sense you don't have to uh, pay for it. Uh, you're just welcome to come stay back and have lunch with us. For all first-time visitors, you can just go there outside. Tell them that you're a first-time visitor. For first-time visitors. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm not saying I am a visitor. No. First-time visitors. Okay. And for them, please go to the lobby. Just say I'm a first-time visitor here. And you can please stay back. They'll give you a coupon. You just go have join us for lunch today okay are you happy that you came this morning amen i'm just going to announce the benediction we'll dismiss please spend time to meet with people greet each other and get to know each other after we close let's close please the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our heavenly father and the sweet fellowship of his spirit be with each of us always in jesus name Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcw4.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.